More on Trump getting arrested. You know we're not just going to stop there. Come on. Come on. Uh, here's another dry watch. It's uh, Rachel Maddow's show, although I didn't see uh, uh, my girl herself there. So let's let's uh, see who this was. But they are talking about uh, Trump looking to uh, raise the civic cost, as they as they phrase it, of a potential indictment. I think that's going to be uh, increasingly relevant as we talk about what uh, Trump's behavior, what his criminality, what the MAGA movement uh, is actually like in terms of consequences and how it gets ugly. Let's, uh, let's have a look. Joining me now by phone is my colleague Rachel Maddow, host of the Rachel Maddow Show here. Oh shoot! On okay, she's there. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us this Saturday morning. What do you make of Trump's latest post? He's made a lot of claims and called for his supporters to protest other things in the past, but is there something different about this one? Jonathan, thanks for having me. I'm sorry I couldn't get in uh, to the studio in time. I wasn't expecting this on a Saturday morning. Um, you know, I, I I think that we have to be measured in our um, response to this just because we don't, as you so rightfully pointed out, we don't have any indication that Trump is responding to some, you know, communication from the DA's office or some act within the um, criminal justice system that we don't have, we the public don't have access to. It kind of seems like he's just responding to NBC News reporting yesterday that law enforcement agencies are preparing for the possibility that he might be indicted. He's just kind of yelling at the TV. Um, so I don't I, I think it is possible to overinterpret what's going on here. Mm -hmm. But those that reporting for NBC is real and the prospect that Trump might be indicted is real. And so with these posts, we know what his response to that will be. We don't know what his response will be in the courtroom. I don't think we've had a clear view of what his legal defense is going to be, but his overall defense is going to be to try to raise the civic cost of indicting him. He is trying mm. to bring intimidation and pressure to bear against the prosecutors who are considering right now whether to indict him. Um, and he's hoping to create fear that there'll be another January 6th type event or you know, his followers will go shoot up another FBI office or, you know, some, something else that he could he could cause to happen by asking his followers to go into the streets in his defense. Yeah, it's the Rico stuff we were talking about earlier. He does not. He doesn't need to say something literally in order for the message to be clear. And he's talking to a group of folks that, let's be honest, have been trained by Christ, have been trained by the uh, Republican establishment to speak this language. Think about all the times they were like, "Do you really want to see thugs in your streets?" Wink. George Soros funded. Wink. Globalist. Wink. You even saw it with uh, neo-Nazis talking about Trump. That, uh, that scumbag that got punched in the face uh, w when it made my whole day, he got punched in the face during that interview. Uh, by the way, there's nothing morally... There, morally, it's never okay to punch somebody. Yet, there is nothing... It's, it's a famous philosophical conundrum because at the same time, there's nothing morally wrong with punching a Nazi. The fun fact. In, in your old pal Jake's book of ethics, simultaneously, it's never morally okay to punch somebody, yet there's nothing wrong with punching a Nazi. Anyway, even that guy, whose name, thank Christ, I can't even remember, said that they give him a pass when he says things that are like, I don't hate Jews, because they know that he has to say that, because his real opinions, their real opinions... Are, uh, are unacceptable. Well, it's not far to go from socially unacceptable opinions to legally unacceptable opinions. Or not even opinions, statements. 
legally unacceptable statements. So they already speak this language of, I'm saying one thing, but you know what I really mean. So when he goes out there and says, uh, take our nation back, that is meant to mean to the people who would concern us to be getting messages from this guy exactly what you're concerned that it might mean. It's supposed to be exactly that. I'm glad you brought that up, and I love But I have to say, on behalf of both uh, Rachel Maddow and myself, I can't know that. This is just Salty Saturday. I'm just being salty. I don't, I don't have a crystal ball that lets me actually see what, this, uh, what that dingbat thinks. There's an, there's an equal chance that he's just thinking Cheetos, Cheetos, Hamburger Melania, drugs, Stormy. Who knows? That phrasing uh, uh, raised the, the civic cost of indicting him. And I'm just wondering, it's hard not to recall January 6th when you read a post like Jesus, the one he put out guy. this morning. And I want you to talk further. Whether How concerned are you and should people be concerned that, that Trump's supporters will see this as a call to action? Well, he's trying to make it that. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that I've been... <laughs> sort of poking around, thinking about and trying to do some research on this week is trying to quantify the number of public officials and former public officials who get arrested and indicted for stuff. And it's it's taken me a few days and I've been poking around at it for a while because it's essentially an infinite number. <laughs> there hmm. are so many state senators, big city mayors, governors, members of Congress, former members of Congress, statewide elected officials of other kinds who get arrested and indicted and thrown out of office and occasionally jailed. It just happens all the time. And it's not the end of the world. It's not even the political end of the world for some, some of those mm -hmm. figures. Wasn't there a guy that literally, I think this was recent, like he literally got arrested and was serving time and ran for office and and one. You know what? I might have heard about this from Rachel Maddow. She might be uh, leading to this. Let's find out. Um, I, I was uh, looking back at Huey Long, who I think is yes, one of the historical okay. figures we've got in this country who's most analogous to Trump in terms of the effect that he has on his supporters. And Huey Long, one of his great last lines, one of his great applause lines at the sort of apex of his political career when he was getting ready to, to challenge FDR in 1936 before he was... Uh, assassinated and then wasn't able to do it. Um, one of Huey Long's great laugh lines was about how many times he had escaped indictment, um, how he, they'd tried to impeach him and they'd try to indict him, and it just made him stronger and stronger and stronger. Getting arrested, getting indicted, even going to jail isn't the end of the line. It isn't the end of the world. But Trump is trying to make it that. He's trying to make it so that there is a threat of uncontrollable political violence in this country that is that would be triggered by any um, any act of the legal system against him. It's his effort. There's nothing intrinsic about him getting in trouble as a potentially publicly corrupt a public corrupt figure um, that that should cause violence. But he's trying to mm -hmm. make sure that it does. And the question is whether his followers do it. I don't think that they're going to this time around. I hope not. I think we should prepare regardless, just in case. But there's a couple of differences here. Number one, there's not a specific place. We are, we're seeing the advantage of the fact that, really, his diehard fans are a small percentage of the country, comparatively. Uh, there's way too many for it to be acceptable. But in January 6th, he said, come to this specific location at this specific time, and here is months to plan. And Charlie Kirk was literally arranging for buses to take people out there. Uh, by the way, Charlie Kirk. Uh, this is different in that there's not the time to prepare. There's not the time for his machine to bus folks out. 
there's also the fact that uh, the date itself is not clear. And there's the fact that Fox News ain't what it was. Newsmax ain't what it was. OAN ain't what it was. Uh, the, the taste for this is going away because what he accidentally did, what he accidentally did was make people genuinely interested in politics and how it works. But when people see how it works, how it actually functions, when, they, when they're truly paying attention to who did what, suddenly it becomes crystal clear that nothing Republicans do help people. Not a damn thing. Look at the train derailment. Think about what the coverage of that would have been like 15, 20 years ago versus now. When Republicans were saying, of course, way to go, Biden. Suddenly, talking to a politically interested audience, people were were able to point out and use the language of politics and say, like, or or, or rather, of literally, of policy, not politics, but actual policy. They were able to say, no, no, no. This is deregulation. This is we can point directly to this. In fact, left of Biden is the way to go here, not right of Biden. Biden should have sided with the protesting workers for Norfolk Southern. But he didn't. But don't get it twisted. This was a Trump administration call. The lack of regulation that they were insisting, that they were protesting for. That's on Trump. Look at the SVB collapse. Once again, they're like, oh, it's woke policy, but the people who are genuinely interested in politics now, a lot of them due to Donald Trump, whether they hate him or love him. They, they are able to look at that and have somebody say, no, 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 wait a minute, no, this is a Dodd-Frank rollback. Remember when we said on the left that big banks should be regulated like huge banks should? Well, here's that clip from, what was it, 2018, uh, of Trump saying, we're now going to be irresponsible dicks. Roll back regulations on bankers. It's, it's not going to be the same in terms of the effect. That doesn't mean, though, that nobody's going to do anything wacky. That's entirely possible. There's a reason there's a phrase, lone wolf terrorist. <laughs> just keep your head on a swivel. But I don't think it's going to have, uh, just because of the logistics... And the environment that we're in now, I don't think it is as likely that we are going to uh, see January 6th, too. And, you know, to to that point, you you anticipated the the next question I was going to ask you. Given this long history of public officials up and down, uh, up and down the roster being arrested and some of them viewing viewing it as a good thing, using the number of times they've been indicted as a punchline in in campaign Hmm. speeches... Is this good for Trump politically? Because he is, right now, a declared candidate for president. Yes. I mean, I think that he's banking on it being something that helps him. But he is playing with a fire that he doesn't know how to contain and that nobody knows how to contain, right? I mean, I think it is a little unnerving that his first political campaign appearance for his 2024 run is in Waco, right? We're at the 30th anniversary right. of the Waco standoff, right? If you're talking about trying to um, trying to engender militant consciousness among Americans about the need to fight the federal government with violence, well, Waco is a nice place to try to do that from. That's a nice resonant place to try to do that from. I mean, it, him being indicted on uh, you know, on, on a charge related to campaign finance, tax and business fraud, um, again, doesn't have to be the end of the world for him and could potentially be a positive for him. But if he's asking for a militant, racially, racially tinged, violent response from his followers, that's something that won't be good for him. You know, January 6th is not good for Trump's political legacy, for all the other things that it is, for all the other things it means for our country. It didn't make him more electable for coming back as another term as president. Um, and, and so he's he's trying to start something that I don't think he can I don't think he can take responsibility for how it will finish. And so I just I don't I just don't think it's why. He absolutely can be held responsible 
for how it finishes, though. Because if you know you can't take responsibility for something, but you start it anyway, don't mean you weren't responsible. It's on his part, yeah. just a pure political strategy for him to be calling for what he's calling for. Rachel, let me get you on one more thing. Just yesterday, YouTube reinstated Donald Trump's account, which means he's now back on all major social media platforms, including Twitter and Facebook. Granted, this post was on his own uh, social media platform, but should those companies regret the move to reinstate him and giving him access to millions of Americans? I don't have a whole pitch for this. I don't have a what you should do plan for it. But I've been thinking about this more and more lately, and now it comes up here. I genuinely believe that we should have a government uh, run and funded search engine, social media platform, literally, video hosting service, a, a, a government version of everything. And hear me out here, it shouldn't be kicking off the neo-Nazis and all that, yada, yada, yada. And by the way, because of that, it will be worse. It'll be worse than YouTube. It'll be worse than Twitter or whatever. But the idea that um, there would literally be a free speech platform or, in essence, a government center for securely holding your data somewhere. I think we have to have it. Think about this. If YouTube were suddenly to change its logo to a swastika, I would no longer be cool with putting my content up on there, right? I hate when people say right rhetorically, sorry. Uh, I would no longer, this is just a fact, be confident uh, uh, or be cool with putting my, my content on there. But what would be the alternative? Vimeo, I guess. Twitch, okay. Let's say they all decide they're going to jump on this new trend, this swastika trend. My point, I'm, I'm giving a comical, ridiculous example, but my point is that literally... Just like there is such a thing as a, a place that makes standard peanut butter. This is true for the government. There is a place that makes standard peanut butter so that we have an idea of what standard is. There should be uh, a place that lets you hold your data somewhere in a standard way. Uh, just like we have banks backed up, uh, the depositor's money is backed up to $250,000. It's the same thing with your data. Data is truly uh, a currency now. And whether that data is you know, a collection of your opinions, which is what social media would be, or if it's uh, just a, a, a bunch of charts you made, whatever. Government storage of that is something that we should have. And it is something where, by the way, it can exist along with a capitalist system of that. There can be separate businesses. A place like YouTube would refine and refine and say, well, you can't have the, the neo-Nazis and you can't have the yada, yada, yada. But right now, the reason we have this conflict at all is because, truly, there's no alternative for people to go to. Just thoughts. Well, I mean, we'll see. I think those companies are in a bit of a um, crisis of conscience right now. And let me know what you think also. Now, and in terms of what their business plan is and how much they want to benefit from um, undermining the democracy that makes it possible for them to thrive as companies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think, I think companies like Facebook, Meta, um, and, uh, and Google and YouTube, mm -hmm. they need to figure out whether or not they're going to let a nihilist like Elon Musk set the tone in terms of what counts as corporate responsibility for something that really does have the possibility to, to, to unlace our democracy in a way that's irreversible, um, or whether they have a sense of self as companies and a sense of responsibility for who they are and what it takes, what, what kind of legal environment they require in which to operate. Um, and and there may I'm hoping that there'll be a reckoning on, on their own terms and they won't be forced to act like they were after January 6th.